All right. Hi, Rafael. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a little tired because the last week I was in the festival of Asa uh, festival of Asad, and here in Brazil, and uh, I come back yesterday. Oh wow! And how, how I say to you, I wake up really early today, oh. and uh, I try to sleep again, but it's not working. So oh, that's uh, that's okay. No worries. I appreciate you. You know, making make getting up early for this, and you know, and having to play. You know, <laughs> yeah. There, we often play, you know, as as performers, we often play at times that we're not used to, you know. And uh, I remember I, you know, I gave a concert in, in Italy. This is a couple of years ago. I was giving a concert in Italy, and I still had jet lag during that concert. I can't tell you how tired it was. It was an evening concert, and I'm based in the United States, so it was, you know, the the concert in the evening. Oh. It felt like the morning in the United States or the afternoon in the United States, and I was just. I mean, I was also dead tired from the, you know, from the uh, So we often play, you know, at times that we're not quite used to. <laughs> so this is good practice yeah. for becoming a concert performer, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot you live in Canada, not in the U.S. I'm in the U.S. right now. Yeah. In the United States. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, um, good. Yeah, so Rafael will play the prelude to the 1006A box suite. Really, really great piece. Tricky piece. Tricky one. Are you trying to play it? <laughs> I mean, it's so hard. It's a hard one, but gosh, what a, a lot of great things in here. Bach is such a good yeah. composer, you know, so many amazing things. You can, never, you can never stop learning Bach. There's always something to learn when you're learning Bach. You know, no matter yeah. how how much you've studied, no matter how old you you are, how long have you been playing the guitar, there's always something new that you can learn with Bach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just take my I just take the mm -hmm. this one because it's better to play. Of course, of course. All right, whenever you're ready, then. Okay.
piece it's a really tough piece and there's a lot of technical yeah. moments in here for sure um, uh, some of your fingerings I really liked some of them I mean so the Kuntz version love love Bach by Frank Kuntz I highly highly recommend using Frank Kuntz's versions for any Bach piece that you're learning I think that he has some of the best fingerings but some of them you know they don't make entirely a lot of sense um, and so we'll, we'll get to those for sure too um, how long have you been playing this piece Sorry? Oh, how long have you been playing this piece? Uh, two months. Two months? Two months. Good, good. You're doing a lot of very, very good work for the short amount of time that you've had. Very nice. So I think the big thing overall to think about is that, you know, there's a big, big difference, Raphael, between playing music from the, the 19th century on, from, you know, the classical slash romantic era music up to the modern era and Baroque music. I mean, that's, pr that's pretty obvious that there are differences there. But I think in terms of expression, where the expression of music comes from, it's very, very different, almost polar opposite from music by Bach in the Baroque era versus anything else beyond kind of, you know, the Mozart era, right? Fernando Sor, Mertz, all of those composers. So when you think of pieces, and let's, let's take specifically, you know, let's take Tariga, for example, Capriccio Arabe, let's take that as an example. When you have pieces by Tariga, you know, and in the 20th century, a lot of the expression comes from major color changes, contrast in dynamics, you know, contrast in, you know, in, uh, in kind of the rubato that's being used also. A lot of this is how we get the expression for music by Tariga. Like I was telling Pablo earlier too, I mean, there's a lot of rubato that's taken, you know, you heard in the 16th notes that we were playing, a lot of freedom, a lot of big color changes that I was talking about with, you know, with Juan before. But in Bach, the expression doesn't come from that because if we do that, then it's almost taking away from the lines that he had written. The expression in Bach comes from the motion of the chord, 
motion. So what is each chord leading to? There's always something leading to something in music by Bach. That's true of all music, but especially in Bach, because it's a little bit harder to be able to differentiate, I think. Where the notes are leading, what the chords are leading to, that's where the expression comes from. So, for example, whenever you have moments that repeat, right? So let's take, you know, the, you know, even starting measure, measure 13, right? You have... You have that section, right? When you play it twice. You play that idea two times, right? Now, I know it says the first time forte, the second time piano, but that's not exactly... You don't want to take that too literally because then it's taking away from the direction of the notes, right? We have this whole, anytime there's a repeat in Bach, it means that something is going somewhere. And in fact, if you look at measure 17, there's a marked forte, right? So you can't go from piano to forte in Bach so drastically. There has to be kind of some motion towards that forte. So I actually think that whenever there's a repeat, you know, even if it's marked piano, you should play it with a little bit more tension, musical tension, leading towards that forte. So instead, you know, of doing this big change, I mean, it sounds a little bit jarring. I think smoothening it out a little bit. It's a lot more subtle, you can hear more the direction of the notes, I think. So to you, when you're playing it, it's actually probably going to feel a lot more stoic than, than expressive. You're going to feel yeah, like you're just playing the notes. But I promise you, it's not like that. We're, we're just doing expression in a different way. So that's something to think about, I think, because any time that you have these kind of repeated moments, I did notice a very, very big contrast that would work very well in Taraga, but in in Bach, we have to be just a little bit more subtle than that, and I think we need to consider more the direction. Where are we, where are we leading to? What is the measure that we are, we are leading to, and how are we going to get there? Does that make sense so far? Okay, Good. so uh, I don't understand perfect, but I understand some words. Okay, so let me know if sense. you want me to, to go over anything again. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'm, I'm also recording this, so if you want to look back to if there was anything, then absolutely, you're welcome okay. to do that. Yes. Um, so that, I think, is a big thing to think about, just to considering the mood of this piece. You know, don't, don't worry about over-exaggerating color or dynamics. I'm not saying not to do it. There has to, of course, within music, I mean, the life of the music comes from the color that we play, right? So there has to be... Color, like color changes and dynamic changes, of course. But, you know, don't, what, what you see is not necessarily all, always what you get in Bach. You have to, again, okay. consider where are we leading? You know, what, is the, what is the highest point of the phrase? So in this example that I showed you, measure 17, that's the, that's the arrival, right? So we have to somehow get to that moment. Make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, and that's true of any other time that this repeats. That that you have that kind of idea too. Okay. So let's let's now um, let's start at the beginning again. But the ver the beginning, you know, you want to make sure that you're not playing it too short, right? Right. We want to outline the arpeggios so instead of you know that that separates kind of this idea. Leads to there, right? It's, a, it's an E major arpeggio. So don't play too short. That yeah, yeah, that's much better. Just connect it. It's an arpeggio, right? Where are you phrasing this, right? It's you know you're phrasing it to that opening. That's basically okay. what you're playing. But, uh, it's not to play really short. Right. Uh, it's really legato, like a legato. Exactly. A little, yeah. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be super, super legato, but you know, connected, right? Connected okay. with the arpeggio. Don't, don't 
don't do too much, don't do too much rubato here, right? Ah, right, just keep going, keep going. that skill very very beautifully crescendo everything okay. kind of leading even though you got to you know a point where you went back down right you repeat you go back down right the motion continues forward right like the, so the way that you did that is the way that I was talking about with any repeated section okay okay good um have you considered adding some slurs too. What do you think of slurs? Uh, um, I don't know what. Instead of ah, like ligatura is a. Um, no, not everyone likes. It. No, I personally, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead. Sorry, uh, because um. Sometimes when I learn a new song, uh, I will to YouTube and watch it there and look at who is playing that well. But I, I don't see anyone do that, but it's, it's looking better. Yeah. yeah. But this note is not so not a big note. So, yeah. So the you know the slur comes the slur adds inflection right mm -hmm. not everyone likes slurs so i'm not going to force slurs upon you if you don't want to do that but slurs add inflection and they also give the right hand a break too right wow. it gives our right hand a break from from doing all the hard work that we're doing in this piece but it also gives a nice inflection and then same thing later Having a slur gives a little more inflection. You can feel a little better the direction because if it's just all you know without slurs, then it, you know it's a lot of work on the right hand. It's a lot of work and it sounds heavy. It sounds heavy. So I think you know okay. consider adding slurs. Now the tricky thing though, Rafa, is when you're adding slurs in Bach, there has to be a pattern, right? You can't just slur anything at any time, right? So you know if I think a very logical slur would be the first three notes at the beginning. Right? There's a slur and then the articulation. So if, if, if you're going to do that, which I think is a very logical place to slur, you have to keep in mind, you know, how, how the rest of the piece slurs that you're going to add are going to be the same as that. Because you can't, you know, with, with Bach it's all about patterns, right? You have to find a slur pattern. So the example that I was doing, measure seven, I slurred the mi to fa, right? You, you use solfege, right? I, I... I don't do this, I make it. Ah, you get a cross string. Ah, yeah, no, that, the cross string is fine too because the cross string also adds inflection too. However, if you're doing that fingering, the, the big, big no no in Bach, yeah, no this. Yeah, I need to, to take the. Or number four. Exactly. Lift that four. But lift it a little bit later too. You still want you want to pretend that it's a slur. If you're gonna slur at the beginning, right? You don't have to, but you know, for the sake of this for now, let's think about it. If we're gonna slur at the beginning, anytime there's kind of an introductory sixteenth note passage, right? For the most part, that's where we're gonna be slurring. So in measure seven, for example, we have a, we have a scale, right? We have the beginning of the scale. So you know what I do, I play it with the slur because I play it down here. But if you're gonna do the cross string, we have to pretend it's a slur. We have to make it sound like. So you know, we want to make exactly what we connect the sound, but without feeling the dissonance, right? So so the fourth finger is gonna kind of come off the strings a little bit later. But you still want to remove it, right? You don't want that, right? No, no dissonant, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
So I think uh, that that. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it can't be like that. Yes, that was good. Okay. That's that. You know, whenever we have the kind of cross string like that, where you know we want to try to mimic the sound of a slur. If you think about the slur, right? It's a very legato idea the slur because it's using the left hand the right hand stops playing and it's using the left hand to articulate the note so the so it has one long note leading to another long note so it's a very legato idea right so if you think about it you know we need to make sure that the cross string is also legato if we're going to try to you know to uh, um, to mimic the slur so it's legato, the second note is not quite as heavily articulated too, we don't, you know, if we think of a slur, the second note is always a gentler articulation, so, right, we can mimic the sound of the slur by a gentler articulation, you know, and making everything, making it very legato, but still lifted, right, we don't want the dissonance, <laughs> right. Okay. For those of you who don't know, in Bach, you know, if you, when you're playing scales in Bach, you never ever want overlapping dissonances unless they're written in separate voices, right? For those in the audience who don't know, um, you know, whenever, you know, because overlapping dissonances, then it gets too, too muddled. You're not able to hear very clearly unless it's written in separate voices. If, for example, you know, I'm taking the scale, if I'm taking the scale, taking the beginning of the scale, right? And let's say, let's pretend this note is in a bass voice and then the other notes are in the upper voice, then you would hold it up. Sorry. If I could do that right <laughs> with the cross string. In that case, if it was written in separate voices, then we would. But since it's not, in this score it's not, we want to make sure that it's it's not a so, you know, I don't want to spend too much time, you know, thinking about slurs, but that's something to think about. But if you wanted to add slurs, it would add inflection. Not everyone likes slurs. I'm a really, really big slur player because I, I like the idea of, of giving the right hand a break and also, you know, being able to make things sound a little more connected as well. Okay. So, yeah, let's keep going then. Why don't you start there at that scale and then and let's continue. soft in the second time around we're gonna flip it kind okay. of so I would start a little bit you know the you know this line here starts something different we just came from right we had this really lovely kind of lyrical idea. something else so I would start that at a different dynamic, treat it, you know, differently. So you had, you know, this, uh, I heard that you were playing it kind of a little bit, um, a little bit more forte, kind of this section, which is fine. I would start it a little bit gentler because then you have oh, okay. room to grow, right? You have room to arrive and lead. Yes. Okay. you had you know you had, a, you had a lovely color you changed to a very very lovely I mean it was a little bit more of a resonant sound I love that keep that going don't disconnect it right we want to connect it connect okay. it to the same color um, you can drop the dynamic so and then you have to grow again right 
but uh, it's not uh, i don't need to change the color it's what you mean i don't think no? yeah i don't i wouldn't change yeah, okay. the color at all you know you, you change the color between phrases between moments right so after you know okay there you know you know there's the there's that phrase and then we have this other phrase it's something else during that whole time I wouldn't change the color you can change the color at measure 13 kind of between those two phrases but then moving on okay. we want to connect right connect. so with Bach whenever okay. we have different colors it does make it sound like it's a different voice right and since this is all okay. the same idea and I would, you know, if you want to drop the dynamic, you don't have to necessarily, you know, continue and go forth in measure 15. But, you know, if you want to drop the dynamic, definitely you can do that. Don't change the color. And I would then crescendo because you have to arrive at okay. that point, right? Right, at that moment. changes though you know when you drop to piano that's fine but then connect it right don't stay piano for too long you know okay because you want to arrive there and make it sound like it's not all of a sudden whoa forte out of nowhere right <laughs> doing too much you know from 17 oh, okay. on I think you're doing okay. too much too many so, so I, and what I mean is too many color changes now you can take you know you're playing this really really well at FS so everything I'm saying you can either take or discard you're the performer but oh. <laughs> but I do I personally personally think that you know there there were too many color changes in that section right so this this moment here right <laughs> It's a little bit of a break of the technical moments, right? We can uh, go, ah, okay, it, this is easy, right? It's not hard. We can do it. it can still be very very effective keeping the same kind of color because again it's all about the lines right it's about the counterpoints about the voices you know so you know you have two different kind of moving ideas here right we have this upper we have we have this upper voice and then we have the lower voices moving So we have two different lines happening here. So I would put, I would think a little bit more about where are these, again, where are these lines going, right? You have this upper voice, right? That kind of rises and then it falls again. And then think about the chords too, right? Where, you know, uh, you know, at, at the very end, for example, we have this big cadence, right? We have, you know, um, uh, we have one, six, four, five, one, back to the E major. 
So think about that. Whenever we have that big cadence, one, six, four, five, one, it's a crescendo and then it's an arrival, right? So I think that's where you have to lead, right? I mean, it's, it's a, let me know if it's not clear what I'm saying, you know, any of you guys, if it's not clear what I'm saying, because um, it's a bit okay, tricky to kind of describe the, you know, the difference. But I think just in general, don't think so much about color. Keep your hand kind of okay. in one position. Think more of the direction of notes, direction. Okay. Can you try uh, it? So I can think about, uh, in La, maybe it's not good to do too much colors. It's I can make the dynamic, but not change the color every time. Within right within a within a section within a phrase or a like you know a, a, a moment within the same moment, I wouldn't change the color as drastically. Okay. Okay. Think uh, we're I can... a bit more about the line, right? So we're going you know with the G sharp, then we're going up to A, back to G sharp, uh, okay. F sharp, E. D sharp dominant. Okay. Six, four, five, one. When we have that five, it's our dominant chord, right? So it's really a, you know, a big dissonant moment that leads, you know. Yeah. Back to our E major, a very consonant chord, a moment of, you know, where we're arriving back on the tonic. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't get much softer, um, you know, around measure 27, 28. I wouldn't go too soft there. I would actually get louder. But in general, that was a lot better, Rafael. I think, I don't know if you would necessarily agree with what I'm saying, but I do think that, you know, again, if we put too many color changes, too many dynamics changes, then it takes away from the lines. It takes away from the movement of the notes, right? We're, we're able to hear much clear, clearer, clearly, the notes going up and then going down, and then this bass line, that's this gorgeous bass line going down. What does that mean in terms of the chords too? You know, I think I think it's much more effective when you play it like that than if you were to play it with a lot of color changes, because then it takes away from that. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, for you, it's uh, when I came to the major. Uh, it's it's strength. It's it's forte or piano. I yeah yeah that's a good question. I think that you know it's let me see. Um, I think it's I think it's you know mezzo forte to forte for sure. You know it's okay. The rival. It keeps uh, but just indulge me for now, you know, because I really liked it. <laughs> um, okay, so when you arrive here, so these, you know, we have, we have kind of, we have a little sequence here, right? Sequence, for those of you who don't know, means when we have a similar kind of intervallic and rhythmic idea in Bach, but it's at a different pitch. So in this case, we have, and then we have, oh, what is it? The same intervallic idea. We have a scale, and then you know this little little idea, and then, and then sorry, right? 
It's all the same kind of rhythmic and, and you know, intervallic idea. It's just at different pitches, basically. So whenever you have, you know, this scale here. So this B, right, the C, that you, the solfege C, note B that you have here, which then appears as different notes later on. or the soul there. So those little notes, I think of them more like bell tones. Bell tones meaning that they're little ping, ping, little, little bell idea, right? Okay. The, the kind of important part of this moment is this little scale that's repeating. scale but then I also think you know here's where we're talking now about the the overlapping dissonances right in this case it's not dissonance though so I see this as two different voices I see this as there's one voice and here's the other voice the other, the other voice is this right the open B okay so I see that as you know as as two different voices which means that they can kind of overlap in sound so I what I would do is I would hold out the G sharp a little bit longer and let the B be open and let it ring out. Instead of. Okay. Right. I would let it ring out. And then same thing later on. What is it? There I would actually play the open E. I would play the open E. You can hear the overlap between these two notes, right? So. What, you mean like uh, this note and this is not? Yeah, I wouldn't. I personally would not do them open. But I also, I mean, you. If, I, I mean, I sorry. I would personally do them open. But okay. you don't have to do that. But what I think is, I think they're two different voices. So either way, because the you talk about it because the shirt. I don't know I, the word correctly, but it's like. Exactly. They're not staccato and you can hear, you know, one, you can hear both notes together. It's not that the G sharp, yeah. it's not short like that. They're connected. That's how I would play that there because I hear them as separate voices. And the reason for that to all of you and to Rafael is because we have the same kind of uh, melodic idea of repeating, right? This little scale that's happening but it continues repeating in different moments, right? So I see that as kind of a continuous growth leading then to this dominant chord. Right? Yeah. So that dominant, you know, idea, the B, the, um, the, yeah, the B major seven chord, you know? So, so that's what, so that's what I'm thinking and that's what I would do there. You don't have to play the, you know, these little bell tones, I call them. You don't have to play them as the open strings, but you know, I do it because it's easier, <laughs> but you don't have to play them as the open strings, but you have to still make them overlap. Okay, the sound, make it longer and hold out the last note of each of these groups. Okay. Sorry. that you were already doing it you can hear just more growth that is happening there okay. if you play it like that than if you were to play it all within the same voice you're yeah. already doing it you know you could feel it you have a good intuition for these things so absolutely um, so okay good I love that let's keep going now start now we're in a different tonal area <laughs> this kind of C sharp major area, right? The Do now is the tonic, you know, kind of in this section. And so a little bit of what I was talking about, yeah, you know, we're in this key, right? The C sharp major kind of section. I'm a little out of tune, sorry. A little bit better. 
from Splatoon. But anyway, <laughs> um, a little bit, little bit of what I was talking about with Juan earlier too is that keys have a really, really important mood change. Um, and Bach, I think, was thinking about a lot of that because he really, you know, he goes into a lot of different keys. You know, he, tri he modulates quite often during this piece and in a lot of his music. And so we have to think about that C-sharp major. So first of all, here's where you could do a color change and you can make it a drastic color change because it's different, it's a different phrase than what we had before, right? We ended the phrase on that, on that dominant seventh chord and then we have something completely different now because you know, usually the dominant seven would go back to one, go back to the tonic, but it's a different tonic now. We're in C-sharp major, it's not E major anymore. So there, you can really, there you can do as much color change as you want in between those sections, you know, if you really want to want to make it, in fact, I would too, I would definitely make it completely different. So, you know, the dominant chord's a lot stronger, right? You feel, you feel the tension within the music there. When we have the C sharp major, you know, C sharp major, it's a very, very kind of round sound. Even if I were to play a ponticello, you can still hear just that the quality of the chord is very, very round. It's very, very dark. So if you want to play into that, you can play it a little more dolce, color change, you do what you want there. But I think in general, it's, you know, it gives a little bit more of this kind of sweet and, and, and simple kind of quality. So I would play it in general just a little bit softer. I would play it a little bit softer. I would play it, just relax your, your knuckles a little bit when you get there. Oh, sorry. So it would be like... You know it grows from there but I would start you know start a little bit more simple you know uh -huh. I think yeah yeah just relax them, relax your knuckles a little more when you get there and you know play it maybe a little softer if you want to change the color there if you want to make it more you know more dolce that would be acceptable absolutely okay <laughs> So good, beautiful the way you did that. I loved all the connection, I loved the color there. I thought that was very, very well done. When we now arrive on measure 38, we finally modulated, right? Now we know for sure what chord we're at. Before, from you know 33 up until you know, the end of 37, you know, we or I guess, no, 32, excuse me, 32 until the end of 37. 32, we have the dominant chord of E major, right? We have this B major 7 chord. So you think it's going to go back to E major, but it doesn't. It goes to C sharp major for a moment. Very yeah. big, big change, right? From there, then we have this whole kind of, you know, there's a bunch of stuff happening. I'm not going to, you know, I don't even, you know, I, off the top of my head, I can't even tell you all of the chords that are happening in there, but it's a lot of different things. So we're in a moment where we are, the audience is thinking, where are we going to? What is the tonic? When we get to measure 38, that is where we know. We know where we are, and we're finally in C sharp minor, right? We're in the relative minor of E major, right? Which is, so there, I think that when we arrive there, that's a moment that we have to play it a little bit more clearly, so articulate well. And, you know, maybe play it, you can also play it maybe a little softer, so it's in our tonic, right? In general, it's for everybody. Anytime that you're at the tonic of the piece, you know, when you arrive back at the tonic, it's softer than the dominant, it's softer than any other kind of tension filled chords that you had from before. This was not the tonic of the whole piece, we were in E major, but now, for now, in this moment, we, this is the tonic. We are now in C sharp yeah. minor. So that, I think, yeah. starting it a little quieter, then you can grow, you know, you know what the phrase is after that, but I think starting it a little bit quieter, making it though very articulate, right? So I, would, I wouldn't I would go so dolce when, if you were there, I would maybe neutral sound, or if you wanted to, ponticello, sure, but you know, a little bit more articulate sound at a piano dynamic is very good at that moment. Going down. Yeah. Then you 
can grow, right? You have, yeah. you know where it goes after that. But there, I would start fighter for sure, for sure. Okay. Overall, very good. Again, just like before, right? Okay. Just like that. Now we have, you know, now we have, you know, in a different key though. Now we're going from, you know, the seven chord of C sharp minor to, to C sharp minor, right? We're going between those two chords, right? This kind of B, I think that's a like D sharp diminished, you know, it's a, it's a dominant chord basically. The 40 measure okay. 43 is a dominant chord leading to tonic. So I think in this section, since we can very, very clearly hear, okay, we are in C sharp minor. There is no mistaking that this is C sharp minor. We can hear from going back and forth between those chords. I think you can, again, let the right hand take a break a little bit, drop the dynamic, play it a little bit more gently in your knuckles. And again, start softer and I would grow. That's what I would do. If you want to go back to piano when it repeats, you can, but again, it leads somewhere, right? I would play it maybe. Okay. So we had, you know, uh, what is it? So I would do something like that. You don't have to do it like that, but start, remember. Not too much. It's more simple, it's simpler okay. than that. <laughs> uh, let me see here. to 47. I liked that you arrived at a little bit of a stronger dynamic when you got to 47. That's great because of that on double sharp, right? Great. But you have to, it can't, it can't be just piano and then forte, right? That's a little like hiccup. Uh, yeah. The audience can't hear it's connected. It should be smoother uh, connected. away. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I mean, it is an arrival, you're right, but don't be too, too soft. Okay. You still want to be clear, right? So. So. You know, still make it our yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a uh, It's been spittingly obvious. Bach really told us, okay, we're in C sharp minor at this moment, there's no mistaking it. Until measure 53, that A sharp. That A sharp okay. indicates to us that we're modulating again, right? What, what key are we modulating to? We're gonna modulate to the B major, right? Yeah. So when we, we were going from C sharp minor now to B major, right? Okay. And this moment at the A sharp is where, you know, at the, at the, uh, the La is where we are modulating, right? So I would put a little more length on that note, really show the audience, oh, our timer, <laughs> show the audience that, you know, we are, we are modulating. Okay, this is where we're going. So I put a little okay. more length, make it longer, accented, yes. And think of that. Okay of the motion of that note going to the B major. Okay. Start, start a little. Can you start? 
heard at yeah. measure like 51, you know, it was yeah. something like that. a little bit more but you can you'll work on the, you know I like to, to start a little softer and then continue to grow instead of doing that okay. you know, all it takes a piano back to forte I like to you know do maybe mezzo piano and then get get to you know get get to forte all the way at 68 I like to do that you don't have to do it that way but something to think about just connect connect those dynamic changes a little bit more I think if that's what you want to do uh, but let's keep going start on 67 let's keep going yeah. Sorry, uh, it's sixty six. So. Okay, six. Yeah. soft not too soft when you get to 79 you know a little more a little okay. a little more volume <laughs> exactly the same basically as you know measure measure 29 what we were doing before that exact same stuff so I would again connect you know oh, sorry let me start uh, where is it um, no it yeah overlap right two different voices just the same as before so you you know you can think about it like that um, but you know different different key same idea okay, so don't make don't make all of those notes staccato right the scale right is all we you know we, we want the scale to to continue to ring and then that bell tone right we, we have those two different voices there right remember okay uh, yeah yeah good good um, Let's keep going then. Let's see. Yeah, because you, you can do that. Let's keep going. Um, yeah, start wherever you want in that section and we'll keep going. Don't make it so static, the bass line. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the bass line here, right? We gotta we gotta make sure that, that that we know where the bass line is going, the direction of these notes, yeah. right? So don't don't play them all the same. Because then we don't hear, you know, what's okay. happening. So we have, you know, at the beginning, F sharp minor, then we have this kind of modulating note, B minor, back to 
F sharp minor, and then modulation, right? So let that let the bass really, really bring out the bass line, I think, a little more when you get there. Try Again, baseline really bring like let bring that out, right? Figure out where what keys we're in, where we're modulating to. You can get that with just one line. You can, you know, you can see what the keys are just from one note. It's possible. In this in this section, it's possible. So figure out what what those keys are. You know, what the chords are the chords are that you're playing, and then what's the direction, right? So you have leading tones, right? So dominant leading tone tonic. Modulating note is usually an accent because it's usually a surprise. There's another modulating note. Sorry, that's leading tone, excuse me. Right? Dominant leading back to tonic. Same thing again here. That's what I mean. I know it's a, you know, I'm not I I'm not describing it very, very well, and I apologize, but I hope, you know, I, that's more what I mean about moving lines, right? So, and, and make, giving direction to the notes. Find out what the chords are that you're playing, and then what does that mean back at the tonic, right? So, you know, whenever, let's say, F sharp minor, right? The E sharp is the leading tone, right? Yeah. So you can hear the direction, meaning the leading tone is going to be a little bit stronger because it leads here. Yeah. Same thing here. Here's B minor, right? The leading tone leads here. So anytime yes. that you're hearing that stuff, you have to be thinking about the relationship of these notes with each other. You know, if we play it too statically. hear anything, right? We just hear note. Note, note, note. There's a little bit, I mean, it's hard, it's hard on Zoom, right? But there's a little bit more direction to these notes that way. So try, try just from there. idea now very very nice okay. let's keep going yeah I, we're i know we're we're out of time but let's let's keep going until the cadenza section <laughs> do you have a little bit of extra time okay, just yeah. to finish this up? okay uh it's uh here maybe <laughs> Much, much bigger because that's coming to the end of this section right now from 109 up until measure 123 it's a cadenza a little cadenza a cadenza again is a free a little bit of a freer moment in music if you think about it in terms of an orchestra a cadenza is when the soloist in a concerto is only playing it's only the soloist not the orchestra so in this case we're not playing orchestral music we're not playing 19th century music is characterized as orchestral this is not because this is Bach but we're still at a moment where it becomes a little bit more soloistic it becomes a little bit you know more free it's a completely different idea 
And then at 123, when we arrive back, then we're back at, you know, the same thing that we were playing before, this B major. So that's where the cadenza ends. But between 109 and 123, this little part here, this whole part here is a cadenza. So I think really taking a, a, a little bit more time to arrive at that cadence and then continue after as if it's a different idea. That I think is really gonna be effective. So I think, you know, you know, we hear this bass line here. There's our arrival. And then you don't want a weak sound right you want it to still be articulate so softer yes but not not quite as arrive I mean it's it's hard on zoom I know okay. you can't hear very well but arrive articulate make it clear you know the sound okay. noticing you know during this section from 109 to 123 this cadenza here you are taking a little bit more time freely with the rhythm and that's good in this section it's okay to do absolutely because it's a cadenza it's more free so you can definitely do rubato there you can you can take you know a little bit more time you know it doesn't have to be very strictly rhythmic absolutely I think you know before the cadenza so the whole piece up until that moment of course you know if you do too much rubato it's gonna fall apart but in this section, in the cadenza, definitely you can take, as you were doing, which I really liked the way you were doing it, taking your time on some notes when you arrive at, at the arrival moments, you know, you take time before you continue, excellent. Then at 123, it's back, right? It's, you're no longer the cadenza, you're back to what we had before. Yeah, yeah. You, you did that very nicely because then, you know, you, you kind of, you know, again, you were a little bit more rhythmic there. You played it with a, with a dynamic that sounded similar to what we had before. So it just tells the audience, this is what we're doing. We're going back, basically. Oh, my goodness. I know I'm going way over time with you, and I'm so sorry, but we're almost at the end. Let's actually try to keep going. Do you mind? Let's try to keep going okay. to the end because we're so close. Yeah? It's here. Yes. We're not in B major anymore, right? Because it's natural now, the la. Yeah, it's it's stranger because here it's with the. Okay, we have. Uh. Sorry. Okay, hold on. It's uh. Right. So then... Okay. Very, very clear okay. note because we're no longer in B major there, right? Because it's not yeah. it's now natural, right? So make it a very, very clear note that okay, we're we're not in B major. We're doing something different. Okay. Yes. Okay.
actually did it better this time than before too. 130, right? We have the cadence. The, the bible is not here. It's, it's this, right? So the first four notes of measure 130 should be connected. So you don't, don't take too much time on the first note of 130 because you want to Okay. The arrival, I mean, it's an arpeggio, it's the E major arpeggio, right? We don't want to, we want to connect that, right? Connect the arpeggio. Yes. The way you did that just okay, now. Okay, I understand. It's be like you. Yeah, and you did a good job in measure 134 and 135 when we stop with the 16th notes, right? That section there, a lot of people when they get there, they like go, oh my gosh, loud, finally I can play this because it's not technically challenging. Oh, sorry. People put a lot of force in there and no, no, no. You have to keep it simple, keep it simple. And so the way you did it was good. Make sure that you remember the way you did it, because I, I really like that. It wasn't too much. And then, you know, you end here. And then it's a little afterthought, right? Right, little afterthought, little coda, right at the end that you finish there. So very, very good. Yeah. Rafael, beautiful, beautiful job. Do you have any questions for me? Oh no, just say thank you so much. It's my, I think you my, my mind, my mind is open for this piece because uh, I'm not working with my teacher at university because I'm the first year yet and uh, I am playing Carcassi again for just for he see, see my technique. So I'm playing, I'm working in this piece alone so thank you so much to help me to continue yeah. the fact that you're doing it without a teacher is impressive because you have a lot of very very good ideas in here at FL. so keep it up for sure and uh and i'm glad i was able to help you know <laughs> so very good yes. <laughs> thank you thanks so much all right let me continue all right everyone that's that's it if you guys have any questions for me Please let me know. I, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything I talked about or just guitar in general. Yeah, John. How how important is it to be familiar with the theory before you even put your fingers on the fretboard? <laughs> I think well, so you're going to get different answers from different teachers, from different people. I personally think that you know, if it, it's it's the math of music. You know, you can't really truly understand, you know, the, the intention of the music and what you are playing if you don't know the theory behind it. You know, especially, especially in Bach, because in that time, Bach was only composing with theory. That was it. He was just thinking of the theory and then he, got, he went to the, right, the musician and went, play what I have here, the chords, you know, um, basically. And so I think that, you know, just with any kind of music, it's really, you know, it's, it's not just notes on a page, it's not just technical uh, abilities. We have to actually understand what's going on in the music, and that is the theory. You know, what is the relationship of everything you're playing? Because everything has meaning. Everything that you're playing has meaning, including rests, including long whole notes, including everything. Everything has meaning. So to know the meaning behind everything that you're playing, you got to know the theory, and you got to know a little bit about the history, too. <laughs> So a little bit of research needs to be done when you're playing, when you're playing music. <laughs> yeah. Great. I have a question. Yes. Um, which exercise uh, we can, we could do to improve our technique? Mm, oh, there's so, so many. Uh, fingers, movement and yes. in general. Right hand or left hand or both? Uh, both, but 
preferably um, right. Uh, okay, so in, in terms of alternating fingers, right, which is what I was yeah, talking about yeah. with you, I think doing a lot of, doing scale, scales and scale exercises are very good because it basically, you know, the alternation comes from, you know, most, most of our alternation exercises come from being on the same string. Right, because that way you're able to practice kind of that alternation and then put it into use into an arpeggio, which is the, the other strings. So I would do scale work for sure. Um, you know, practice scales slowly, practice them with different kinds of rhythms. But, you know, I would practice that with I and M or M and A, I, A. I don't know if you guys saw one of my videos on, on Instagram kind of a while back, but I was playing through kind of all the modes, right? If you learn yeah, your yeah, modes, that's a, yeah, that's a good one too, because that one you can just kind of, you know, you can, it's all, at a certain point, it can become mindless. You're just playing kind of through these scales, but you're also learning your modes, you're learning the, the scales on the guitar, and you're learning about alternation and, and the, you know, um, the coordination of the fingers. Yeah. Sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can All send right, that, um, I can send that, yeah, to, that one to you, that specific kind of modes exercise if you want. Just send me a message to remind me, but I can send you okay. that that, okay. I, that I did too. Um, um, left hand? Left hand. Left hand slurs. I'm a big slur. I'm a big slur person. I know Rafael, we were talking about this. I'm a huge, huge into slurs. Love the slurs because I think slurs are very, very good for a developing left hand technique too, you know, which is all about the extension motion and the compression, but especially the extension, right? This movement. And so slurs, I think are really, really good. I have a few different slur exercises that I usually give to my students, but slurs again, involve being on the same string. So what I, I would do something like, you know, practicing maybe chromatically, hammer, hammer runs, or, you know, maybe two, three, three, four, maybe, you know, going up, excuse me, yeah. going up from there. You can, you can practice them the other way too. Three to two is tricky, right? So on and, and the go up and down, you know, you can come up really with so many of your own exercises when you play, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot you can do with just simple scales and simple chromaticism, right? So I would, I would maybe do something like that on all of the strings. So you can practice the different positions in the left hand too, because you're not going to have the same position of the elbow from here to here. Cause look what happens, right? You know, to get to the sixth string, yeah. you have to move in a little bit. So the hand comes up, right? So I think, you know, I think doing slur exercises in the left hand are very, very good. That's a good way to, to learn. And again, you know, send me a message if you want any specific exercises, cause I have, I have a whole ton of them. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Were there any, any other questions? Okay. Guys, it's been such a pleasure. All three of you played really, really well. Keep it up. You have a very, very bright future ahead of you with music, all three of you. So keep it up. In general, guys, if you want more, you know, specific information, please do send me a message. I do teach private lessons and also through my Arpeggiato Music School. Um, so either one, you know, I, we, we can definitely chat about that if you were interested in, in continuing further with music, any of you, not just the three players who played today. Um, so just send me a message if you ever need anything. But, um, but yeah, this was a lot of fun, you guys. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening, wherever you guys are in the world, and um, I'll see you on online. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. <laughs>